All right, ladies, we're so grateful to have you. My name is Sherelle Warren. I'm your teaching leader for this class. And I don't think we have any announcements for today, so I'll pray, and then we'll get started on the lecture. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for you, Lord. As the song reminded us, Ancient of Days, Lord, we give you praise and honor because you're Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, Lord. And we are so grateful, Lord, that you are with us, Lord, that we know you and the pardon of our sins, Lord. And for anyone who does not, may their hearts be pricked that they would come to know you today and forevermore. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Wow, ladies, these lessons, we have had so much to cover. And I kept wondering, Lord, what were you going to give me for uh, today's passage? And I keep hearing this message that God is trying to tell you something. God is trying to tell me something. God is trying to tell us something, right? And so for us that have eyes to see, let us see. And for those of us who have ears to hear, let us hear. All right. So in last week's passage, we saw that there was a lot going on there, right? And I'm going to kind of just give you this little reference to set the stage, right? When Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Then the word of the Lord came, and Elijah the Tishabite, have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring disaster in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. So that's a prophecy, right? And we see that clearly. And so let's get, dig into these passages that we have today. So today I gave you two uh, divisions. And so our first division is Ahab died in battle, refusing to heed God's warning through Malachi. We're going to see this in 1 Kings 20, 22 through 2 Kings chapter 1, um, chapter 1, uh, 18. I have something else here, but it just must be a a little uh, side mark on me. So guys, I think it was chapter 1, uh, 18, but just bear with me. Second Kings 1 through 50, that is correct. Amen. And then uh, on our second division, we have Isaiah died refusing to seek God, uh, Israel's God. And that was first, first Kings 22, 51 through second Kings 1. There we go. Amen. Okay. So ladies, what is happening here when we see these ki the king of Israel, right, and the king of Judah? Well, we know that there had been, what, some type of peace for a while, right? So we see three years, that for three years there was no war bet between Aram and Israel. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, went down to see king of Israel. So isn't it interesting that we're going to see in these passages that Ahab is only referred to as what? The king of Israel. You'll notice that, but the king of Israel is Ahab, okay? So he said to his officials, don't you know that Ramoth Galilee belongs to us and yet we are uh, doing nothing to retake it from the king of Aram? Okay, so we know that Ahab what? Was real big on acquiring other people's property, right? Mm hmm So he's taken note of this property that belongs to them, but they haven't taken control of it, right? So he asked Jehoshaphat, will you go with me to fight against Rahoth, uh, Ramoth Galilee, right? And so Jehoshaphat replies to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses, but Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord. Okay, so if you all noticed, there's a marriage here that's connecting these families, okay? So I do want to point that out to you. All right, that Ahab and Jehoshaphat first allied when their families were in marriage, which often 
uh, initiated political and economic cooperation, right? So they were working together. Jehoshaphat visited Ahab, which is what we were talking about, in the palace, right? And so they were wanting to take these two armies in battle to, to regain this property, okay? So Jehoshaphat was what? He was a, a man of God, right? So he, he wanted to seek counsel before they went any further into this, into this war, into this battle, right? So he asked for Ahab to, to basically find out if there was a prophet of God, right? Now, before we go into this particular part, let's look here, okay? So the king requests a prophet to confirm the military cooperation was from the Lord before they consented to do it, right? So Jehoshaphat suggests that they seek God's counsel regarding what? This potential military assault. So Ahab, he brings, which is the king of Israel, right? He brings 400 of his prophets who all declared that God would give what? Victory, right? And so probably in his mind, he's thinking, well, God gave me victory before. He's going to what? Give me victory again, right? But his motives weren't right, right? We're going to see this. So Jehoshaphat asked if there was a true prophet of the Lord remaining, because we know that Jezebel and Ahab, what? That they had killed so many of the Lord's true, what? Prophets, right? But Ahab says, yes, there is one. But he is not happy about this one. This is Micaiah, right? That's who he's talking about. Well, we know why he's not happy. Because Micaiah is not going to tell him what he wants to hear. And isn't that a little bit like us? Don't we seek counsel from those people who got our back, who are going to tell us exactly what we want to hear? So maybe that's why we don't call our mom so much, right? <laughs> I know, I know. I got a one, and she's up there somewhere, and I love her for that good, good counsel. Amen. So unlike Ahab, uh, you know, Jehoshaphat, because he was a man of God, that's why he wanted to seek God's counsel. But what happens when um, he has, Ahab has this hatred for Micaiah, right? So he calls him and to kind of go a little bit more into it, Micaiah declared that the Israelites would be scattered, right? But we're going to look at really a little bit more about what Micaiah actually says, right? Okay, so you have Ahab. He has the false prophets of Baal, 400 in the number, right? It seems that none of these prophets spoke what? For the Lord. And we know that because they were what? False prophets, right? But somehow, even with us, we think that false prophets would lack what? Sincerity, right? But it's no different than today when we have false prophets. These people speak with what authority, but it's not God's authority, right? And they speak as though they are telling the truth, right? I don't know about you, but there's a, a lot going on in these days. And I noticed that a lot of teenagers, including mine, he'll speak with some authority. And it's something that he thought up in his head, but it wasn't actually the facts. So we have to reference, not that he's a false prophet, but I'm just saying we can all do that. We can have something in our heads. It isn't factual. It isn't what God said. But yet we speak with all authority as though it is the truth. But it is not the truth, right? So we want to be conscious of that in our Ahab moments, right? Okay. So Ahab wanted to hear only the counsel that he agreed with, right? He dismissed and mistreated anyone who spoke the truth if he did not think that truth was favorable, right? Even though Micaiah prophesied his death in battle, he continued to seek his own way. So it's probably really similar when we are at church and our pastors are speaking and, and prayerfully we're at a good, sound church that speaks the word of God, we 
don't want to hear what the pastor has to say, right? And especially when that message just seems like it was all for us, like they had just focused in on us and didn't take our eyes off. It's like, oh, and they step on all our toes? No, we don't want to hear that. That's not what we want to hear, right? But that doesn't mean that that word is not the truth of God, right? So we've got to decipher that even in our Bible study as we hear the word of God and as we're reading and as you're here for the lecture and things that are going on, you may not like what's being said, but if it is the word of God, then you accept it and let God impart what he wants to do to transform your heart. I want to be that way as well. I'm not always that way, but I want to be more that way every day. All right. So then there is this um, kind of like this false prophet. He kind of seems like he's the head of the false prophets, right? Okay. And he gets on this utterance and he is saying this and then he uses this metaphor that gives a favorable outcome, right? So we're going to call him Prophet Z. He presents a sad warning regarding the fate of the false, uh, false teachers. The fellow claimed authority for his predictions from God, right? But not the God of the Bible, okay? So we want to make sure that we read the word for ourselves so that we cannot be led astray by false prophets. Know the word of God for yourself, okay? That way when someone tells you something, I always tell my kids, I would tell them when they were little because they seemed like they loved to read and they studied the word. But I told them, I said, you may go out and someone may tell you something different, but you know the word for yourself. When I was your age, I didn't know the word for myself, right? But you do. So if you hear something, don't receive that just because somebody says that and they're in, in authority, right? So we need to know the word for ourselves. That's what we should take from that, right? Okay, so... When we look at the qualifications of Micaiah, all right, let's, let's look at a little bit about Micaiah's strengths. All right, this is God's prophet. He confronted a powerful king. He had humor under pressure. We're going to see a little bit of that, right? And he ignored public and peer pressure, and he delivered the truth, right? A little bit sarcastic. We see that, okay, which didn't really work for him. It kind of provoked even more resistance. But God's faithful prophet, and he was in the house of Ahab and Jezebel, right? Amen. So God may put us some places we don't want to be, but when he puts us there, we got to make sure that we're still speaking the way, the truth, and everybody ain't going to want to hear it. And one of the things that I can remember uh, early on is that people, they may not like me, but they respected me. And now I don't even know if they respect me, but that's all right. I'm going to keep speaking the truth. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter. To God be the glory. Yeah, we got to lay it on the line, even if it means that we don't get respect and we don't get favorable opinions. We want to know that God favors us and he's happy with us. So um, let me share this with you. While Micaiah agreed to the summons, he indicated that he would listen to the Lord, not wanting to deceive the king and lead to his destruction. So Micaiah first agreed with the false prophets, right? But then he spoke the truth, right? But he did this kind of sarcastically. So per perhaps he was frustrated or fearful. Maybe he was even using sarcasm to expose the real motives behind their requests. All right? So, as Micaiah was doing um, this and saying these things, Ahab picked up on the irony. It was true that the Lord permitted Ahab's deception, but the message communicated that Ahab was disposed to believing all along. So, this is interesting because... Ahab insisted that the prophet tell him the truth, right? So even though he wanted these false prophets to tell him what he wanted to hear, he still wanted the truth. But what was the motive behind why he wanted the truth? I think that's what we need to look at here, right? Okay? Because he had already been given these prophecies, right? But he had been rejecting the prophecies, okay? So... The prophet told the king 
what would happen just as Ahab had expected for him all along, right? So we see that there's frustration here with Ahab, right? But then we're going to see the defeat of Ahab and Jehoshaphat. All right, so I want to point out something to you that we're going to see here, that when Jehoshaphat and Ahab continue on, even though God had given them through the prophet the word, right? But they still went into battle, right? So did Ahab possibly think that by using a disguise, that maybe that's why he wanted the truth because he wanted to say, okay, well, okay, I want to hear the truth of God, but I don't want to hear it because I'm going to abide by it and obey it. I want to hear it so I can think about what I could do, you know, in the meantime and in between time, right? It's possible, right? So God allowed a deceitful spirit. God is not a deceitful spirit. Do not get that confused, okay? Okay. But God allowed a deceitful spirit to entice Ahab, okay? So Ahab got to hear what he wanted to hear. People are taught to seek voices of the majority. People who believe in a lie follow the impulse and the ways of the world and are blind to the devil's influence on their lives, including using people who claim to speak for God. Micaiah was called by God to boldly proclaim his word to believers and unbelievers. People who willingly stand with God can humbly stand against the majority. Amen. We seek God through prayer and Bible study and trust God for his direction and timing to speak truth. With whom, with whom is God asking you to share his word this week? Where is God sending you to humbly speak the truth? I pray that for me, as well as for you, that wherever God sends us this week, that we would speak the truth. Amen. All right. So let's keep it going here, ladies. Okay, so Micaiah is a model for all of us who live in the culture of uh, permitting and tolerating that we should stand and oppose things that are not of God, right? Okay. So, in Ahab's defeat, we're going to see that in spite of Malachi's true prediction and Josephat's knowledge of the prophet was truly from the Lord, his weakness for alliance proved evident, right? Ahab and Jehoshaphat went together into battle. My, my. Jehoshaphat was a godly king, he, but he did not remove all of those what? The, those idol-worshiping uh, places, right? He allowed what was wrong while doing what was uh, his duty in Jerusalem. The consistency would be amazing if it did not mirror all of us as well. What does this tell us about godly people left alone to ourselves, what we would do, okay? So we are just like even Jehoshaphat, even though he was a man of God, he still did something contrary to what God had asked of him. All right, so here we go with the disguise of Ahab, his brilliant plan. All right, Ahab went into battle. He disguised himself. Lack, um, likely he was thinking that he wouldn't be killed or recognized, right? But despite his deception, a random, not so random, arrow slid between his armor and dealt him a what? Mortal blow, right? He propped himself up in the chariot. chariot. So he wasn't done and he was still going to give a, have another opportunity, right? To come to God, right? Because he didn't just die immediately, right? All right. So facing the uh, Ermines, uh, as he bled out and died, right? God's word prevailed and the dogs licked his blood as God had declared. So the interesting thing about it is that the blood had kind of spilt in the chariot and probably what spilt on the ground. So, I mean, just as God had said, that's exactly what happened, right? Okay. Mm. So, 
We're going to keep it going, y'all. I think I lost my place a little bit. So Ahab disguised himself to try to avoid death. Men who believe in a lie, um, that's rebellion against God, okay? So remember that. We don't want to mock God, all right? So what disguise do you need God's help to remove? Ah. What are we putting up, right, that is against God, that God cannot do the transforming work that he wants to do in us? And I just ask that it's hard to be vulnerable. Um, I know a lot of you all, when you're in your classes and you're discussing these lessons, there is a lot of vulnerability. And God could use that. You know, you think, oh, my goodness, you know, I may look a little strange, look a little weird. Well, I feel a little strange and I feel a little weird a lot of times. But it's okay because if God uses it and it may help someone else. So take a risk, okay? Be vulnerable. Jehoshaphat went into battle wearing his royal robes as Ahab suggested. Even though his robes made uh, him a clear target, um, he did not die, right? Right? Because we saw that the attackers, what, they didn't pursue him. They pursued Ahab instead, okay? All right, ladies, we're keeping it going. All right, so our first principle is refusing to seek God results in deception. Refusing to seek God results in deception. Okay, so we've talked about the, the death of Ahab. So we want to focus in on God's word and his plans that stand, unchanged by human rejection or deception of evil. God controls all circumstances and works to accomplish his plan. Eve, uh, he often has a greater purpose at work than we really understand. God hears his children when they cry out to him, even in the midst of mess, a mess of their own making, right? God will judge the wicked in his way, in his time. So when we look at these opportunities for Ahab to what? Come to God, to repent, right? And God was merciful, even in his unfaithfulness, right? It's just like us. So we need to make sure that we come to God. When we don't make the right choices, we make decisions that don't line up with God's plan. God is merciful, right? And we want to come to him and ask for forgiveness. Hmm. So why do you think that the writer of Kings uh, dedicated so many of these chapters to Ahab's reign? More than any other king in the northern kingdom. Could it be that God was extending mercy to a man who just would not listen? And when he did, demonstrated only short-lived, what? Repentance, right? I think it shows that God's longing that mankind will receive his mercy. God was gracious in not allowing Ahab to see the devastation of his, king, of his kingdom in his time. Even in judgment, God reveals mercy and grace. All right? So let's talk about our doctrine today, which is the fulfillment of prophecy. God repeatedly sent prophets to warn King Ahab and offer him the opportunity to turn to him. Right? Yes, he did. God's true prophet words came to pass both in battle and in Ahab's death. God, who knows the future and governs all outcomes, accurately foretells events before they happen. The Bible is full of hundreds of prophecies that have already happened, just as God foretold. Many biblical prophecies were fulfilled in Christ's first coming, and many more await fulfillment when he returns at his second coming, right? Fulfilled prophecy validates the integrity of the scripture and reassures believers of God's sovereign control over history. There is much we do not know about about the future, which looms before us and can feel uncertain. What lies ahead can often make a source of concern for us. Fulfilled prophecy provides comfort in uncertain times, okay? So, 
biblical prophecy and God's record of faithfulness in keeping his promises provides hope and certainty when we face life, death, and eternity. So when I don't believe that God knows the future and keeps his promises, right, I miss navigating life with only what I can understand and predict. Life changes so rapidly that the events and circumstances I face may seem random and what? Unpredictable. But when I believe that the Bible's prophecy proves God's faithfulness, control, good plans for my life and the world, I can have security and hope. I may not know all the details about the future, but I can rest knowing that God knows and controls what I cannot. Amen. God keeps his promises, doesn't he? All right, ladies. So let's keep it going, all right? So we're going to see um, that Jehoshaphat reigned for 25 years and did what was right in God's eyes, but did not fully remove idolatry from, from Judah, right? His reign was not perfect, but God was gracious in his assessment of Jehoshaphat. And so that's similar to us. It won't be perfect, but if God is with us and he's transforming us, then we just give honor to God for that. We know that Jehoshaphat was, um, he, let's see. I'm looking here. Okay, ladies. All right. I think I have a little mistake in my little document here, but we're going to keep it going. All right. So he was one of the um, eight godly monarchs in the kingdom. And we're moving on to Second Chronicles 17.6, uh, which indicates that he removed the high places. Some cultic centers must have been reestablished. So this is kind of just giving us a little summary of what went on through Jehoshaphat's um, reign, Okay. So Jehoshaphat cemented the relationship of the nations in his alliance with Ahab by, um, by marrying his son, uh, I think it's pronounced Jerom, to Ahab's daughter, okay, Alethea, Alethea, all right? So I'm going to take us to our second uh, division here, which is Asiah, uh, a high Isaiah died refusing to seek Israel's God, okay? And this was what we saw in 1 Kings um, 22, 51 through 2 Kings 1, okay? So we're looking at the reign of Ahiza um, of the northern kingdom. Ahiza reigned two years in Israel and died um, and did evil in God's sight. He followed the ways of his father Ahab and his mother Jezebel, as well as Jeroboam, Israel's first king. He caused Israel to sin against God and worshiped Baal, right? So he ruled for two years, okay, in succession after Ahab, all right? His reign was a religious tragedy, for he followed in his father's footsteps. We find another example of what? Like father, like son. That's what we're seeing here, right? These were bad influences. So the kingdom of Judah struggled with idolatry and sinful choices, but God raised up kings to turn them back to truth. God preserves the destiny of David, upholding the promise of the Messiah that would be born through the David's royal family. Israel had many kings from many uh, destin destinies, but they continue to perpetuate this evil and idolatry, right? So God honored the king of Judah who sought him and blessed the people even when their obedience was imperfect. He disciplined his people to turn them back to him. God graciously acknowledged that Judah's kings did right. Israel persistent rejection of God's prophets and warnings and their perpetual idolatry, idolatry aroused his righteous anger. Even when their ongoing disobedience, God continued to reach out to rebellious kings and people of Israel. Even his judgments were intended to draw them to recognize his power and turn them back to him. 
So what were the circumstances surrounding the death of Haziah, right? It was an injury. That was the circumstance. So he didn't go into battle, right? So maybe he did learn something from his father after all. And when he didn't go into battle, he fell through lattice, right? And when he fell, he sent a messenger to what? Not to God, right? Okay? So to these what? I don't know if you want to say these false gods uh, of um, Ekron, right? So he inquired with Baal-zebub, okay, whether or not he would recover. So then Elijah steps back on the scene, and we know that Elijah is the prophet of God, right? And Elijah, he is basically going to give what? This declaration, right? And Elijah is sending a message to Haziah, okay? He says, the angel of the Lord sent Elijah to confront Haziah uh, for seeking help from Baalzebub rather than from him, Israel's God. Elijah was to pronounce judgment and tell Uzziah that he would die from his injuries. When Uzziah messenger delivered Elijah's pronouncement, a company of 50 men were sent to Elijah to call him into the king's presence, right? Elijah demonstrated that he was indeed God's representative and fire consumed what? The first sets of the 50 men and the captains, right? And so then, aha moment, another 50 men were sent, right? And thus, okay, we saw that the same thing happened. So that happened twice. And then the third group begged for mercy and they were what? Spared. So when we repent and we go to God, he will give us grace and mercies, right? So Elijah went down with these men, right? To deliver the prophecy to Haziah of his certain death, which happened just as he said. So that takes us to our second principle. Refusing to surrender to God brings destructive consequences. Refusing to surrender to God brings destructive consequences. The word of the Lord to uh, to Elijah was that Isaiah would not recover. The angel of the Lord told what Elijah to ask the messenger why Isaiah, why would he worship these what? these false gods, right? So when you think about this, just think about the fact that time after time, God is doing the same thing with us. He's trying to call us back to him, right? To call us back to him, right? And we don't want to be like these first sets of people, these 50 men that went out, right? We want to be like those, the third ones. We want to get it. We want to get it and we want to repent and follow God, right? And so there was a question in your lesson that asked, you know, what was, was Elijah harsh in doing what he did? Well, we got to know that God backed, what, Elijah up, right? And so when we do what God asks us to do, it may seem harsh, but If it's what God asks us to do, then God will back us up, just as we saw with Elijah. There is an attribute here that is from this passage this week, and it's just. God's justice is perfect. His decisions are always based on his righteous character. God cannot ignore sin because he is holy. It would be unjust to ignore wickedness, rebellion, and sin. God is just and does not show favoritism. Every penalty will be fair and right. God does not treat his children as their sins deserve 
because Jesus suffered the full punishment for our sins because God is just. He will never punish his children for sin for which Jesus paid on the cross. So if you are a believer and you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then you can rest that you will have eternity with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. All right, ladies. And so I do want to end today, and I just want to share with you um, this, basically this truth as we close, that God's people, we sin, right? And we know that, okay? We're no different than these people that we see in the biblical stories. But we know that God is there, right? Right? And he wants to love us, he wants to save us, and he wants to rescue us. And so I pray that as we go out today, even in making our decisions in our everyday life, that we remember that God is there. He wants an intimate, personal relationship with us. And that is exactly what he wanted with Ahab. He wanted an intimate, personal relationship, and he went after him again after again again and again, and he showed him grace and mercies. Our God is there. He is there to show us the same grace and mercies. I ask that you surrender in the name of Jesus and run to him in your weakest and most triumphant times. I'm going to pray and close us out, ladies. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for just being with us, Lord, that you have gone before us, that you have prepared the place for us, Lord. May we see you and our everyday life, and may we be so careful to pray, to give you all of our cares, our burdens, Lord, and may you continue to rescue us in our most desperate times. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.